But like his brother, the new monarch did recognize Gibbon's talents. Impressed by the Cosimo panel, James commissioned the carver to create a gift for another Italian aristocrat, the Duke of Modena. But the Modena panel, housed in the city's museum, was to be a far darker and almost prophetic piece of work. Gibbons made this extraordinary panel for uh, James II, and it's a, what we call a memento mori. It's a classical uh, piece with the skull and the fruit. You can see that it's it's going. Everything is transient. And there is a wonderful detail, which is a song in the middle by Shirley, which says, the icy hand of death doth lay on kings. Scepter and crown must tumble down. So, uh, it's a very uh, gloomy, um, modest piece for someone who has just become king, as if to say, I am, you know, that I will only be here for a short while. The piece displays Gibbon's growing confidence. It even includes a self portrait. But the imagery is so morbid, it seems to prefigure the downfall of his new patron. James couldn't help but display his Catholicism. He commissioned Gibbons to make another object one that would have utterly appalled his Protestant subjects. It can now be found in the Church of St. James's, Piccadilly. This grand Italian-style organ loft was originally constructed by Gibbons for James's private Catholic chapel, itself an inflammatory statement in a Protestant country. It's full of angels and cherubs heralding the glory of God and the crown. But also within this church is one of Gibbon's finest masterpieces. This Rerados, a decorative screen behind the altar. It contains a beauty even hard-line Protestants could enjoy. He avoided controversial pictures of the saints and instead drew on images from the natural world. Finner Ayres has managed St. James's since 1999 and feels a special affinity for this type of religious sculpture, going back to being a child. My father was a sculptor in almost all materials you can imagine. He used to work in ivory, brick, stone and wood. So, yes, I think I knew about Grinning Gibbons before I knew about Enid Blyton, you know, there were sort of... We didn't have children's books at home, we had books on Grinning Gibbons. It is so abundant, it's air flying with the birds, it's the sea with the shells, grain to eat, it's flowers to enjoy. It's trying to keep alive and give immortality something which is perishable. You know, they will all be consumed and will rot away, but they're here now forever. We can all see them. There's an intellectual part of me that doesn't like it because it's so excessive. Um, and it's, you know, it's a clever bloke showing off to toffs, you know, so there are a few bits of it that I don't like at all. But it overwhelms me with how beautiful it is, how incredibly abundant it is, how rich it is. And I like very much something we don't do now, which is, if you look at that, it's not at all symmetrical. 
and yet it's perfectly harmonious one side with the other and the top with the bottom. But there's no repetition, there's no boring old symmetry. It's just very strong, terribly clever. <laughs> James II's pride knew no bounds. Like his brother Charles, he commissioned Gibbons to create a bronze statue of him as a Roman emperor, which today stands outside London's National Gallery. But this statue was in stark contrast to political reality. There was nothing triumphant about James's reign, as his Protestant court plotted to overthrow him. In 1688, a desperate James was forced to flee to France at midnight, a coup which came to be known as the Glorious Revolution. And for Gibbons, this had to be a terrifying moment. He'd spent nearly two decades celebrating the glories of the Stuart kings. By now, he was 40 years old, with a large family and studio to support. Would his work fit in with the new regime? However, favour was to smile on the carver once more. Because after the fall of James, William of Orange took the throne. A Protestant, but just as importantly, a Dutchman. This was a monarch who was about the same age as Gibbons who'd also imbued the spirit of the Dutch Golden Age. They spoke the same language, both literally and artistically. When William and his wife Mary chose to transform the Palace of Hampton Court, Gibbons found his services in demand once again. William and Mary uh, from 1688 are the good Protestant uh, monarchs and everything must be a contrast to uh, the Catholic James who has now left. And when they remodel Hampton Court, it's plain, it's formal, and uh, yet they want to employ the best of current uh, craftsmanship and Gibbons comes in there. And it's interesting because the things that uh, we love about him some of the things absolutely fall away i mean you know there are no uh, lobsters and there's no drapery and there are no musical instruments and there's the the playfulness and the kind of elaborate design has gone and and he uses this much simpler vocabulary really of fruit and flowers and swags It's taking the best of the past, but it's not looking decadent or overdone anymore. Gibbons created some of his most beautiful carvings for King William, but as a decorator, he wasn't above cutting a few corners, as you can see if you get up close and personal with his work. This is designed to be seen from below. And when you come up on the scaffolding, what you look at is what you shouldn't be seeing. So if you have a look at the top of this angel's head, for example, if you look at it from below, it's absolutely perfect. Lovely mouth, lovely nose, beautiful hair. And as you get towards the top, when nobody sees it, you can see where the chisel has been. This is a carver who really uh, knows what he's doing and if you have a look round at the back of the bird in order to make it light can you see the little cuts inside with a very tiny chisel can you see that and as a conservator you can see that and nobody else sees it which is I think the reason why we all become conservators so we can look at stuff nobody else can to achieve these kinds of effects Gibbons had literally hundreds of tools he amassed them over a lifetime of carving, far more than any of his contemporaries. Wow. 
David Esterly has spent decades building up a collection of the kinds of implements that Gibbons would have had at his disposal. Why so many tools? Well, with wood, you slice through it and it leaves behind on the wood the shape of the blade. Therefore, if you're doing something as complicated as a sort of very high relief, very naturalistic foliage carvings that Gibbons is doing, then you need to have a multitude of tools to get the various shapes. He would have had back bent tools and front bent tools for deep excavations. And he would have had some really very sophisticated tools. For example, a front bent veiner, a small tool which you would use for uh, putting a vein of a leaf in at a very low level. One of the reasons why I th I, I'm sure that this is what Gibbons's tool bench would have looked like is that some of these tools go back almost halfway to Gibbons's era. And some of the old carvers wrote their names or stamped their names on their chisel handles. A. Gordon, I wonder who he was. But it's, it's sort of like shaking hands with the old fellow whenever I use it. So it's, there's a romance about these tools which affect me even after all these years. And in the 1690s, Gibbons would have needed every one of his tools and tricks to please his most demanding patron yet. Because the most difficult client Gibbons ever had to deal with wasn't a monarch, but a duke, the owner of Petworth House in Sussex. One of the most influential men in Britain and a close ally of King William was Charles Seymour. And he was fully aware of his own importance. He was so famously vain, people called him the Proud Duke. There are all sorts of anecdotes about Charles Seymour, the Proud Duke, and why he was, he was so proud. Um, for a start, uh, there's the one where he docked his daughter's inheritance by some 20-odd thousand pounds um, because she sat down in his presence but he was actually asleep at the time. Uh, there's another famous one where he um, dismissed one of the servants uh, for turning his back upon him, uh, forgetting the fact that the servant, the poor chap, was actually fanning the fire with bellows, and it's very difficult to do that without um, turning your back. So this is the sort of man we're, we're talking about. But he, he was a very cultured man um, and brought in many of the finest craftsmen in England uh, to work at Petworth House, one of whom, of course, was Grinling Gibbons. This is Gibbon's masterpiece, a magnificent carved room full of ingenious nods towards the proud Duke's obsessions. We can certainly get a sense of his interest in gardening, which of course was very fashionable in the wonderful floral arrangements represented by Gibbon's. There are the great um, Grecian urns, so there's very much an allusion there to the proud Duke's interest in classical culture and so on and so forth. As we might expect, the proud Duke was a knight of the garter. We can see very clearly the, the, the George hanging from a ribbon as carved by Gibbons. But also music is represented very firmly here. Amid the violins in Gibbon's great musical group is an open manuscript of Purcell's Fairy Queen, which was hot off the press. It had only just been performed on the London stage in 1692. So it's a very important celebration of um, not only the proud Duke's cultural sensibility, but also his connection with the royal court. It's completely jaw-dropping. Every time um, I walk into this room, I am completely overwhelmed by the brilliance of, of what surrounds me. Many people have just never really experienced anything like this before, and for a start, they're completely blown away with the sheer technical skill. Something which